do what you need to do, but we'll get the next going here in about four minutes. side of the big island of Australia. An echo link. Met in uh well it's seven fifty minutes. VK sixty. Someone in there uh, from the Georgia conference, uh if you'd like to try it again, uh, please go ahead. Okay, the screen's filling up here on uh, Echo Link. Our tech light note
five FC. net every fourth Monday at 7 p.m. W5FC. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. to start Skynet in less than a minute. If you need to use the repeater, please use so quickly. This is in 5B. Welcome. Uh, this is N5BB, November 5, Bravo, Bravo. 
My name is Bill, and I'll be your net control for this session of the Dallas Amateur Radio Club, Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Central Time concerning the subject of astronomy and space in general. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs all amateurs interested in this topic. And we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign break break in your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic at this time? is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction of net control. That would be me in 5BB. And stations are reminded to identify the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on 146.88 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using W5FC-R station ID or Echolink node 37 I am looking at uh, Echo Link and the chat going on over there. So if you need to uh, say something in net control, you know, uh, include it over there, but, you know, put it in bold letters or something so I can see it because there's so much other chat going on. Um, let's see. Oh, boy, somebody's editing what's happening here in real time. Um, tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Go to www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. You do not need, need, you do not need to be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. Next 90 minutes long, structured in several parts. I'll whiz through these very quickly. General announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas, National Space Society, discussion topic of the evening by me. What's up? Space exploration and space history, constellation of the week, space launches of the week, recent astronomical discoveries, visual, visible satellite passages, Astronomical questions and answers, and the 73 room. All amateurs licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in. We're going to do RF check in first and then Echo Link later. Um, so Chaz is trying to hide something from me. Oh. Well, all I can see is you're a boar. Oh, that's what he's trying to hide from me. Oh. So I guess he thinks he's a boar. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> next, let's start with low, let's start with short time check-ins. Any stations that can't stay very long, please come now with your call sign, name, and your location. That's short time check-ins. This is in 5 BB, that controls for Skynet. check-ins. Let's try one more time. Any short-time check-ins to Skynet, please come now. Wow, that may be a sign this is going to be a short net. We will see. Let's start for general RF check-ins. We'll do Echo Link later. So if you'd like to check-in to Skynet, please come now with your call sign, your name, and your location. This is in 5BB, net control, Skynet. Kilo 5, Juliet, Delta Whiskey, John in Coppell, Texas.
November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony, outside observing the moon on East Dallas. Kilo Fox Tribe 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha. Chaz, Mesquite. Oh, isn't that wonderful? International Observe the Moon Night. Uniform, Uniform, Julia, Dustin, and Dallas. Whiskey 505, Oscar Zulu. Fox Truck 5, Michelle Golf, Uniform, Bob, Mesquite. W5, BLT, Whiskey 5, Bacon, Lettuce, Tomato, Bill, Garland. November 5, Oscar Fox Trot, Clay, and Mesquite. Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie X ray, Tom, who is still? Kilo India 5, Sierra Delta, Sierra, Jeff Richard. This is Whiskey 5 Golf Uniform Sierra Gus, far, far northeast Dallas. Kilo 5 Golf Lima Delta Randy Relic. This is Kilo Golf 5 Whiskey Victor Lima James and Carrollton. KF5JDW, hello John, NT5TM, Tony, KF5JHA, Chaz, KF5UUJ, Dustin, and uh, yeah. uh, WB5OZL, Brenda, KF5HGU, Bob, W5BLT, Bill, and 5 OF Clay, KE5ICX, Tom, KF5SDS, Jeff, W5GUS, Gus, K5GLD, Randy, and KG5WVL, James. Do we have any other RF check-ins for Skynet? This is in 5 p Bravo 9, Sarah Oscar Keel is shot in Fort Worth, also outside of viewing the view. And right, recognize KF5, excuse me, KB9, that's okay, Sean. Do we have any other check ins to Skynet via RF? This is in 5BB. IMS, JJ, are you, are you going to be silent tonight? Yes, he's listen only. No problem, JJ, we got you checked in. Uh, KFI, JHA Chaz has already checked in. KG5BZW, J, do you want to check in on audio? Very 
good, Jay. And I also see Kelly, K5KTX. Kelly, do you want to check in via audio? Five KTX, uh, checking in. Back to you. Very good. We have you. And KF5 HGU, Bob, we got you before on RF. AA5 AH. Uh, I believe that's Robert. Robert, do you want to check in the uh, uh, audio? I got it right. Aren't you Robert Richardson? Well, I think that's correct. Okay, Robert. Okay, yes, I'm ZBL Bill. I think you're in Chicago. You want to check up and uh, check in and voice bill? Good evening, Bill. Can't find the BL Bill here. Yes, it's Chicago. Check in and voice. A oh, very good, Bill. If it's clear and you go out and look at the moon tonight, that that time of year, International Watch the Moon Day, night, or whatever. Okay, do we have anybody that would like to check in via any mode that I haven't gotten to so far for Skynet? Any mode, if you'd like to check in, I haven't gotten you yet, please come now with your call sign, your name, and your location. This is N5BB, Skynet. Golf 5, Alpha, Papa, Lima, Patrick, and Dallas. This is Kilo, India 5, Sierra, X-Ray, Echo, Brandon, Wiley. Kilo, Echo 5, Zulu, Charlie, Whiskey, David, and Rowlett. KG5 APL, hello Patrick. KF5 SXE, hi Brandon. K5 ZCW, hello from Rowlett, David. Do we have any other stations that would like to check in the any mode to Skynet? This is N5 B. heard. Now let's move on to the next section of the net. Do we have any general announcements? These could be things about uh, local amateur radio activities, uh, any other amateur radio activities anywhere in the world, astronomy or space, or of general interest to him. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about a lot of things during the net, but things that you have reason to believe we won't be talking about tonight and the rest of the net. Please come now with your call sign only. This is N5BB, General Announcement. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. NT5TM, go ahead, Tony. I bet you you're going to talk about the DARC meeting. And maybe some other things too. Go right ahead. Into 5 p.m. in 5 BB. Hi, 
uh, yes, if you'd like to go observe the moon, uh, please remember that it is setting. It's a first quarter moon picked to give a beautiful 3D effect so you can see just how rough and bumpy the moon really is. Uh, but that means it's only a few hours behind the sun. Uh, so get out there uh, now uh, and have a look at the moon if you have a telescope or binoculars handy. We do have a lot of DARC activities coming up. The club newsletter posted at W5FC.org has more details about most of these. Tonight at 10.30 or so p.m., or often a few minutes late to let people catch their breath, we'll be talking about the 1966 Color Italian Space Oddity. I think it was called War Between the Planets. The title just keeps falling right out of my brain. It was such a memorable movie. Uh, yep, love it, hate it, thought it was fun. Didn't finish your popcorn. Talk about it tonight on this repeater at 10.30 or so. Tomorrow night at 7, we have the meeting on the air, open to any ham who'd like to share what's going on in their ham world, and the Racy's training net at 8. Everyone can listen to the training, but only Racy's appointees in the Dallas area may check in. This Monday is Ham Fixin's Net right here at 7, and this Tuesday is going to be an interesting and fun club meeting. The board meeting will be at 6, the general meeting is at 7. They are both at the in the third floor community room of the Dallas Medical Center. That's the hospital in the northeast corner of Webb Chapel and LBJ, the former RHD. Our presenter in that 7 o'clock meeting is Virginia, NV5F, who will be talking about her experiences building an almost flight-worthy CubeSat simulator. Uh, just learning about everything from programming to procurement. Uh, very difficult task, and I've read her AMSAT article. It was really good, and I'd like to hear from her in person about it. So I'll be there this Tuesday at 7. I hope you will, too. This is NT5TM, hoping that if you watch the Afterglow movie, you survive without injury. Very good, Tony. Does anyone have any questions about Tony's items or any other news announcements of any type? This is N5BB, Skynet. Kilo 5, Golf Lima Delta. K5GLD, go right ahead there, Randy. Yes, sir. Uh, about a month or two ago, there was a uh, star party in Garland slash uh, Richardson, and we had some problems that the police did not respond to, and that seems to have disappeared. That meeting seems to have disappeared. I'm wondering, is that ever going to come back, or, or what? What is the uh, progress on that? K-5 Gildy. KF5JHA. Okay, go right ahead, Chad. Hi, yes. Uh, there's been problems with that star party in the past, and so right now the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas has suspended that particular star party. It may be relocated to another uh, uh, location, but uh, that's still under review. So uh, you'll have to stand by. There's actually a uh, our party going on tonight uh, at uh, Mesquite Planetarium. Uh, we'll probably get to that in a few minutes. KF5, JHA. Okay, that was not on the uh, on the website as far as the Mesquite uh, meeting. Uh, will that be added at any time soon? K5, Jilby. That's a special one for the International Observe the Moon program. Uh, we were asked to help out with that at the Mesquite Planetarium tonight. KFI, JHA. Okay, I hope that resolves it. Does anybody else have any uh, announcements or questions about the current announcements? This is N5BB, Skynet. Now, let's see. This is 
and by BB, Skynet. AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, has two local nets here in the Dallas area. The East Net meets every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. on this repeater. Except for the first Tuesday of the meeting, which is the Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting. It skipped then, so don't listen for this net. It's coming Tuesday, but every other Tuesday, except for the first Tuesday, you can learn about satellites and the AMSAT in general on this repeater at 8 p.m. on Tuesday evening. Then on Wednesday evening at 9 p.m., that's right, one hour later, 9 p.m. Wednesday evenings, you can have the Arlington, the AMSAT net west, on the Arlington 147.14 megahertz repeater, also with a PL of 110.9, but with a positive offset. And that's how you can learn about uh, amateur satellite things. There's a lot of other nits going on on this repeater. Uh, this is in 5BB, uh, break. On Monday, we've got various things going on. Ham fixing, emergency communications, am fixing the geek net and if there is a fifth monday a surprise net if we told you what it was it wouldn't be a surprise on tuesdays we have the amsat east net at 8 p.m as i mentioned on fridays we have to search city simulation but all kinds of nasty things happen at 8 p.m on friday evening on this repeater you can learn about emergency communication on Saturdays, we have the Night of Nets. Yes, tonight. TechNet at 7 p.m. SkyNet at 9 p.m. until 10.30. And then at 10.30, we have the Afterglow Net, uh, which we will talk about in just a moment. Uh, then every uh, night, we have the ARL National Traffic System Net at 6.30 p.m. on this repeater. If there's noise, the backup repeater is the Irving 146.72 repeater. That's what happened this evening. And then the late session of the ARL National Traffic System Net is on the Irving 146.72 repeater at 10.30 p.m. every evening. All are welcome to check on, on any of these nets. If it is a traffic net, please listen so you understand when to check in and uh, what the purpose is of the check-in. Now, we have an afterglow net tonight, uh, night, and there is a movie, War Between the Planets. Tom, can you please describe this movie? You know, uh, we know that your lips won't be in sync with what you're saying because it's a dubbed movie from Italian, but still give it a try. K5ICX, N5BB. What's going on with this war between the planets? Well, thank you, Bill. And it looks like I didn't post it. Please hold for a second. I'm doing three things at once. I'm trying to get uh, was up updated. So give me a second here. Uh-oh. Oh, that's a critical thing. Um, we can defer that later in the day if you'd like to, Tom. Um, okay, I'll get it off the website. Just take me a second. Okay, we'll pause here. This is one of these interesting Italian movies where uh, it's got photography that just looks a little different. Special effects and spacesuits that look a little different. The clothing, oh man, these Italians are natty, and their hair is immaculate. It looks like uh, that everybody's got uh, uh, either a permanent or a spray here, hairspray to keep their hair so it doesn't move an iota. It's very, very distinctive hair. So, Tom, what, what are the planets? What's this war about? All right, Bill, here we go. In my highly accurate uh, version, description of this movie, it's as follows. 
the commander of the International Space Station side. The Russians were up to their usual hijinks. They had just put red Kool-Aid mix in the water system, freaking out the other astronauts. Someone had recently short-sheeted his bunk, and the intercom system was playing the disco version of the Russian national anthem. He entered his bunk and closed the door. He felt it was time to watch the movies. He earbuds set to 200. Immediately, War Between the Planets appeared on his laptop screen. He closed his laptop. He knew he, he knew he had been duped. He really wanted to see Battle of the Planets, not this one-off bit sequel. Oh well, what could, what more could go wrong? Then he noticed the gold glitter and empty vodka bottles floating by his bunk. So join us for the dubious Italian film or. War Between the Planets from 1966 tonight at 10.30. There are two links, Tubi and Pluto, where you can watch it for free. Back to you, Bill, KE5ICX. Now, Tom, uh, if he was British, the astronaut would really want to be listening to The Planet, which is a seven-movement orchestral suite by Gustav Holtz. So, um, yeah, that's a very impressive piece, The Planets. But no, he was listening to this crazy Italian movie. You know, the Italians, you know, the Italian cars, Italian movies, they're a little bit special. Italian actors. Okay, uh, next, what's up here? Well, it's not what's up yet. But we do have Chaz. It's time for the Texas Astronomical Society. Before we put Chaz on the spot, I'm going to ask for check-ins. Do we have any other check-ins? This is in 5BB. It's kind of... Good evening, everyone. This is KF5JHA, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting. will be held on Friday, October the 28th. Uh, and the meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Dallas, uh, University of Texas at Dallas, and is also held on Zoom. The featured speaker will be Michael uh, Reimer, uh, or is it Reimer? I, I'm not sure. And his topic will be the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be related to keeping our skies dark for astronomy purposes. And the Saturday public observing sessions have begun again. As you heard earlier, the, the first Saturday of each month uh, has been put on hold for a while. But tonight, uh, the Texas Astronomical Society was asked to help out with the uh, public observing that is going on at the Mesquite Planetarium. Is there anyone at the Mesquite Planetarium that's a ham radio operator that would like to report in what's going on tonight? to hear anybody. Well, Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night uh, so that there was an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Public Observing Session. You can check the TAS website. It's run by volunteers, so it might not always be up to date, but at texasastro.org, and it will give you information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. And this is KF5JHA, back to our net control. Very good. Thank you, Chad. Does anybody have any questions, or do we have any additional check-ins to Skynet? This is in fact BB. Okay. Next is time for National Space Society events and activities. Uh, Myself, Bill, in 5BB, happens to be, I happen to be the membership director of the North Texas chapter of the National Space Society. Our chapter has won many awards, uh, I can't remember, seven or eight in the last decade, as the best chapter uh, of the year, uh, best national 
space about each chapter of the year, including uh, this year. So uh, we're very active at local, you know, events and things. And uh, we have a meeting on the second Sunday of every month, which is very early this month. It'll be on Sunday, October the 9th. Our meetings start at 3.30 p.m. And currently we're doing meetings which are hybrid. You can be there in person or you can look at them on WebEx. If you want to see any of these meetings on WebEx or if you have any questions about the meetings, you can send me an email, n5bb at arrl.net or space at byrom.net. That's B-Y-R-O-M dot net. Send me an email and I'll send you a, uh, I'll get you on the list to get the uh, WebEx, get invited to the WebEx meeting it's coming uh, a week from tomorrow. Or uh, I'll tell you how to join the National Space Society in our local chapter if you're interested. The, uh, the meeting coming up here a week from tomorrow is going to be by the B612 Foundation. By the way, you might wonder, why uh, is it called the B612 Foundation? You might wonder that. Well, the reason is there was a um, 1943 book, The Little Prince, by uh, Antoine de saint Uspre. I can't pronounce his name, uh, her name. And uh, the hero, the, the uh, hero, um, his asteroid home, their asteroid home is B612. So that's why it's named for that. The B612 Foundation tries, is interested in coming up with asteroids that might impact the Earth. And of course, if they're big ones, they could five BB. If they're big uh, asteroids, they might do a lot of damage or kill all the humans on the planet or something like that, just like dinosaurs were wiped out. So that's what the B612 Foundation does. And on uh, a week from tomorrow, our virtual speaker is going to be Joachim Moyens, M-O-E-Y-E-N-S. He's the co-creator of Thor, T-H-O-R, He's an Asteroid Institute fellow, and uh, his presentation will be the B612 Foundation and their search for asteroids. So that's what's going on there with the National Space Society. The really big news for uh, the next year is going to be that the International Space Development Conference which is the yearly big meeting of the National Space Society, will be in Frisco. Not San Francisco, but Frisco, Texas. Uh, just a few miles from wherever you are here, listening to us. So uh, it'll be at uh, Hilton Hotel up there. So uh, if you join the National Space Society, you normally get big discounts for going to the International Space Development Conference. So it's a really good time to be joining the National Space Society. And if you do join the first year, you get free membership in our local chapter for no additional charge. So that's what's going on with the National Space Society and the International Space Development Conference, where you're going to be able to hear about people that are uh, planning for, you know, hotels in space and... Um, there's a recent announcement, in fact, by Hilton about some things they're doing. And, um, you know, activities going to the moon, plans for going to Mars, uh, what kind of plants will grow and food will grow on Mars and all that kind of stuff. Lots of detail. Lunar Gateway Space Station, Artemis. And you'll hear it from people who are like vice presidents and heads of engineering and other key people for these different groups. It's a very neat meeting. Instead of meetings you get to go to. Okay. That's all about the National Space Society. 
Before I continue, does anybody have any questions? Or do I have any check-ins? This is in 5 bb I'm the control. I will present this. This is from Scientific American, an article recent here in, June, in September. The James Webb Space Telescope's first glimpses of early galaxies could break cosmology. That's right. Chaz might have to be telling people different things about the early universe. After uh, some of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope images and later ones get get uh, analyzed, it's it's crazy. So um, here's how this article this article is by Jonathan O'Callaghan, and it was posted on September the 14th, 2022, by Scientific American. So. Rohan Naidu was sitting at home with his girlfriend when he found the galaxy that nearly broke cosmology. As his algorithm dug through early images from the James Webb Space Telescope, which as you remember just started sending images back a couple of months ago, late one night in July, Naidu shot to attention. It had sifted out an object that, on closer inspection, was inexplicably massive and dated back to just 300 million years after the Big Bang, older than any galaxy ever seen before. I called my girlfriend over right away, says Nadu. I told her, this might be the most distant starlight you know, humans have ever seen. After exchanging exciting messages with one of his collaborators with lots of exclamation marks, Nadu got to work. Days later, they had published a paper on the Canada Galaxy, which they named Glass Z13. That's G-L-A-S-S dash dash Z13. The Z13, of course, has to do with the redshift. The Internet exploded. It reverberated around the world, says Nadu. Even Captain America would share the story on Twitter. This is in 5BB, Skynet. Ooh, that's an exciting story. Sounds like it's a, uh, a movie. The extraordinary discover of this galaxy just weeks into the James Webb Space Telescope's full operation was beyond astronomers' wildest dreams. James Webb Space Telescope, the largest, most powerful, most powerful observatory ever launched from the Earth, was custom built to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Stationed 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth from earthly interference, chilled within striking distance of absolute zero by its in this quartzite sunshade, the telescope's giant segmented mirror and exquisitely sensitive instruments were designed to uncover never-before-seen details of the cosmic dawn. This is the scarcely probed era, no more than a few hundred million years after the Big Bang itself in which the very first stars and galaxies coalesced. How exactly this process unfolds intimately depends on a witch's brew of exotic physics, ranging from the uncertain influences of dark matter and dark energy, to the poorly understood feedback between starlight, gas, and dust. By glimpsing galaxies from cosmic dawn with James Webb Space Telescope, cosmologists can test 
their knowledge of all these underlying phenomena, either confirming the validity of their best consensus, consensus models or revealing gaps in understanding that can herald profound new discoveries. This is N5BB, Dallas Image Radio Club, Skynet. Such observations were supposed to take time. Initial projections estimated the first galaxy would be so small and faint that James Webb Space Telescope would find at best a few intriguingly remote candidates in its pilot investigation. Things didn't go quite as planned. Instead, as soon as the telescope scientists released its very first images of a distant universe, Astronomers like Nadu at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology started finding numerous galaxies within them that, in apparent age, size, and luminous luminosity surpassed all predictions. The competition for discovery was fierce, with each new day, it seemed, claims of yet another record-breaking earliest known galaxy would emerge from one research group or another. Now, you don't usually hear astronomers saying this. Everyone was freaking out, says Charlotte Mason, an astrophysicist at the University of Copenhagen. We really weren't expecting this. In the weeks and months following James Webb Space Telescope's findings, of surprisingly mature early galaxies, blind-sighted theorists and observers alike have been scrambling to explain them. Could the bevy of anomalously big and bright early galaxies be illusionary? Perhaps because of flaws in analysis of the telescope's initial observations? If genuine, could they somehow be explained by or cosmological models? Or, just maybe, were they the first hint that the universe is more strange and complex than even our boldest theories had supposed? This is in 5 db kind of. At stake is nothing less than our very understanding of how the orderly universe we know emerged from primordial chaos. James Webb Space Telescope's early revelations could be poised to rewrite the opening chapters of cosmic history, which concern not only distant epochs in faraway galaxies, but also our own existence here in the familiar Milky Way. You build these machines not to confirm the perigen, but to break it, says James Webb Space Telescope scientist Mark McCaughrian, the senior advisor for science and exploration at the European Space Agency. You just don't know how it will break. This is in 5BB, kind of. Deep looks for cosmic dawn. One might say that James Webb Space Telescope's observations of early galaxies had been billions of years in the making, but more modestly they trace back to the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore in 1985. At the time, the Hubble Space Telescope was still five years away from launching on a space shuttle, but Garth Ellingworth, then the deputy director of this institute, was surprised one day when his boss, the then director Ricardo, Ricardo Giacconi, asked him to, to already start thinking what would come after Hubble much further down the road. I protested, saying we've got more than enough to do on Hubble, Ellingworth recalled. But Giacconi was insistent. Trust me. It'll take a long time, he said. Oh boy, <laughs> was that an understatement? So Illingworth and a handful of others got to work, drawing up concept ideas for what was then known as the next 
Generation Space Telescope. Later renamed to James Webb Space Telescope after a former NASA administrator. This is in 5 BB. While Hubble would be transformational, astronomers knew its capabilities would be limited by its observations and visible light. As light from a very distant galaxy travels across the cosmic abyss, it is stretched by the expansion of the universe, a broadening of wavelengths known as redshift. The higher the redshift value, the more stretching light is experienced, and thus the more distant, distant its source of galaxy will be. Redshifts for early galaxies are so high that their emitted visible light is stretched into infrared by the time it arrives at our telescope. This is why Hubble could not see them. The next generation space telescope, for comparison, would observe in infrared and would boast a very large and very cold starlight gathering mirror, allowing it to peer much deeper into the universe. Everybody realized that Webb would be the telescope for looking at early galaxies, says Illingworth. That became the primary science goal. This is in 5 BB. Let's try again. The need for the telescope was highlighted in December 1995 when astronomers spotted Hubble at a seemingly empty patch of the sky for 10 days. Many experts predicted the extended observation would be a waste of resources, revealing at best a handful of dim galaxies. But instead, the effort was richly rewarded. The resulting image, the Hubble Deep Field, showed the, quote, empty, unquote, spot, was actually filled with galaxies by the thousands, stretching back 12 billion years into the 13.8 billion year history of our universe. There are galaxies everywhere, says Illingworth, now an astrophysicist at the University of Cal uh, California, Santa Cruz. The Hubble Deep Field showed that the early universe was even more crowded and exciting than most anyone had expected offering observational treasure to those who took the time and care to properly look. Yet, impressive as Hubble's deep field was, astronomers wanted more. After more than two decades of labor, at a cost of some $10 billion, James Webb Space Telescope finally launched on Christmas Day 2021. By July 2022, the telescope had reached its deep space destination. Its instruments had been put through their paces. Its long-awaited first year of science observations, known as Cycle 1, could begin. A portion of the telescope's early time was devoted to high-impact programs across a range of disciplines, from which data would immediately be made public. Two of these, SEERS at C-E-E-R-S, the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey, and GLASS, the Grissom Lens Amplified Survey from Space, would each independently spend dozens of hours looking for distant galaxies in the early universe by staring at separate small patches of the sky. Not much was expected perhaps a slightly more ornate version of the Hubble Deep Field, but nothing more. Stephen Finkelstein from the University of Texas at Austin, the lead on CERS, says extremely distant galaxies were only predicted to pop up after a few cycles of data from multiple programs. This is in 5BB, Dallas Amateur Radio Club, Skynet, in progress. Instead, much to the surprise of astronomers, such galaxies came into view immediately. Hubble's record for the most distant known galaxy had been GNZ11, 
spotted in 2015 at a rate shift of 11, thanks to the 2009 upgrade to the telescope that enhanced its modest infrared capabilities. A rate shift of 11 corresponds to a cosmic age of about 400 million years, a point at the brink of when galaxy formation was thought to begin. From the very first glass data from the James Webb Telescope, two teams, one led by NADU in that breathless late-night discovery, independently found a candidate for a more distant galaxy named Glass-Z13 at a redshift of 13. Not 11, we're talking 13. Some 70 million years further back in time. In their thirst for quick results, the researchers relied on redshift estimates derived from simple brightness-based measurements. These are easier to obtain, but less precise than direct measurements of redshift, which require more dedicated observation time. Nevertheless, excuse me, nonetheless, nonetheless, the simplified technique can be accurate, and here it suggested a galaxy that was unexpected effectively bright and big, already bearing a mass of stars of a billion suns, just a few hundred times less than that of the Milky Way, despite our own galaxy being billions of years more mature. This was beyond our most optimistic expectations, says Tommaso True, an astronomer at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the lead on GLASS. This is in 5BB, Skynet, talking about what's going on with those James Webb telescopes, distant galaxies. The record did not last long. In the following days, dozens of galaxy candidates from CERS and GLASS sprang into view, with estimated redshifts as high as 20 just 180 million years after the Big Bang, some with disk-like structures that were not expected to manifest so early in cosmic history. Another team, meanwhile, found evidence for galaxies the size of our Milky Way, which is incredibly large, at a redshift of 10, less than 500 million years after the Big Bang. Such behemoths emerging so rapidly defies expectations that a cosmologist's standard model of the universe, uh, evolution, called Lambda CDM. This is the Lambda Cold Dark Matter. This model incorporates scientists' best estimates for the properties of dark energy and dark matter, which collectively act to dominate the emergence of large-scale cosmic structures. Lambda refers to dark energy, and CDM refers to dark matter that is relatively sluggish or cold. Even if you took everything that was available to form stars and snapped your fingers instantaneously, you still wouldn't be able to get that big that early, says uh, Michael Boyan Colchin, a cosmologist at the University of Texas at Austin. It would be a real revolution. This is Dallas Image Radio Club Skynet in 5BB Net Control. And I'm going to um, cut out some of this. Uh, back to the drawing board. And I'm going to skip that, that section. A rush to break the universe. The rapid flow of scientific papers from James Webb Space Telescope's early observations is no clue. When the first data started streaming down, astronomers were eagerly waiting. People have been working on the pi their pipelines for years, a boy and Colchin said, eschewing the traditional peer review processes, which can take months. Many instead turned to publication on ARXIV a website where scientific papers can be uploaded after minimal review by moderators, but well before formal peer review. 
and increasingly today's peer review is effectively unfolding in near real time for all to see on Twitter and other social media platforms. It's science by ARXIV, says Naidu. The action caught some off guard. I expected a lot of activity since Nancy Levison, uh, the Science Institute's this STFCI's interim director, but I underestimated the amount. That allowed scientific results to be rapidly publicized and discussed, but some fear the cost is the cost. People were rushing things a bit, says Claude uh, Papadon, James Webb Space Telescope's project scientist. The gold standard is a re- refereed peer-reviewed paper. Early calibration issues with James Webb Space Telescope, for example, may have affected some results. Nathan Adams, University of Manchester in the UK, and colleagues found there could be dramatic changes with one galaxy at a redshift of 20.4 recalibrated to a redshift of just 0.7. We need to calm down a little bit, Adam says. It's a bit too early to say we've completely broken the universe. Such issues are unlikely to eradicate all the James Webb Space Telescope's high redshift galaxies, however, given their sheer number. It's more likely that the early universe is different from what we predicted, Finkelstein says. The odds are small that we're all wrong. Astronomers are now racing to conduct follow-up observations with James Webb Space Telescope. Levinson says she's presently reviewing about a dozen proposals from various groups asking for additional James Webb Space Telescope observing time most of which are seeking to scrutinize high redshift galaxy candidates. Concerning the excitement and importance of these early discoveries, we thought it was appropriate to ask for a little bit of time to confirm them, this is true, who put forward one of the proposals. Tom says it's time to close this up, so I will. I was just nearly finished anyway. Um... James Webb Space Telescope has been the springboard for an unprecedented era in science. Despite all the uncertainties, the rapid exchange of ideas as new discoveries are made and media publicized has invigorated astronomers. It's been fantastic, says True. It's fully wonderful to see the community so engaged and excited. Now the question is, if we can truly believe what we are seeing, is it time to reappraise our understanding? of the dawn of time, we're peering into the unknown, Mason says. That's all. Okay, Uh, this is N5B. This is Skynet. Do we have any additional check-ins? This is Alpha Golf, Snyder, Sierra Golf, Antonio. Got you. Do we have any other check-ins? Just kind of. Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf Cruise. KF5, KWG, we got your cruise. Do we have any other check-ins? 75 US, uh, quick question. Uh, go ahead, Gus. Thanks, Bill. Uh, w 5 us here. Uh, well, theoretically, I wonder what the uh, redshift value would be uh, back all the way back to the dawn of time. Uh, I wonder, of course, here, that would be theoretical, but uh, I wonder what that would, the value, redshift value would be. w 5 us uh, I think it's a little problematic. Chaz? Do you have an answer for that? Uh, I guess Gus is asking what the largest possible redshift is. Is there such a number? K5, a JHA, if I be. Thanks for the question. That's hard to answer, especially with uh, things in flux right now. So, Gus, uh, that's probably something for our future to determine. K5, JHA. 
Okay, Gus, does that not answer it appropriately? <laughs> yes, indeed, it sure, sure does. I guess there is no answer, uh, answer uh, yet, but uh, just theoretically, and that would be pretty far distant. Okay, thanks, Dad, and thanks, Bill, for the time for you and yeah, it's probably the wrong time to ask that with all these <laughs> new discoveries happening. Okay, very quickly, do we have any other check-ins before we continue with what's up? Any more check-ins? This is N5BB, Skynet, looking for check-ins. Yes, what's up? N5BB, go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Randy, KE5JIT, is on Echo Inc. I believe he's in Louisville, so please check him in. Yeah, this is Chaz, KF5JJ, my degrees in astrophysics. I work at the astrophysics labs and geology labs at the Dallas College on the Brookhaven campus, and we do call this segment of Skynet Was Up. Slide master, slide number two. I'm sorry, I forgot to put the right slides into the slide deck. Last weekend, I was absent from Skynet, but I was still participating in ham radio activities. I was a part of the radio communications for the Plano Balloon Festival. There were more than 30 hot air balloons that, I, and that uh, participated in the festival. The newest balloon was called the Flying Saucer. It's only been inflated less than 10 hours before the Plano Balloon Festival, and so it's not even rated to fly yet. It was kind of fun to see. I've got a picture if you're looking at the video version of it. Slide master, slide number three. The new moon was on September the 25th, so the current phase of the moon is a waxing crescent. Just a day away from the first quarter moon, which is tomorrow. And on October the 4th, the moon will be at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 369,325 kilometers. Slide master, slide number four, please. October is stuffed full of five meteor showers with four minor meteor showers and one major meteor shower. Uh, October the 4th and 5th, the October uh, Camelopardids uh, will peak with a handful of uh, meteors per hour. The Draconid meteor shower peaks on the night of October 7th and 8th and may have a handful of meteors up to maybe a thousand meteors per hour. It's, eh, who knows? The Southern Torrid a meteor shower it uh, peaks on the night of October the 9th and 10th with around, again, a handful or five meteors per hour. The Epsilon uh, Gemini meteor shower peaks on October the 17th, 18th with just a few meteors per hour. And finally, the major meteor shower on October 21st, 22nd is the, uh, oh, I forgot to put it down what it was. Okay, I'll have to look that up for next time. Uh, but it has about 20 meteors per hour. Uh, more information can be found about these meteor showers at the International Meteor Organization at imo.net or the American Meteor Society at amsmeteors.org. Slide master, slide number five. October the 8th, when the moon and Jupiter are in conjunction in the eastern sky, it'll be a great sight. Jupiter will be very bright. Slide master, slide number six. On October the 15th, the planet Mars will be in conjunction with M1, Messier 1, which is also known as the Crab Nebula in the eastern evening sky. And in the eastern evening sky, I've got to look that up. Oh, yeah, it's in the eastern evening sky. Yeah, because... Taurus was rising late in the evening. Uh, slide master slide number seven on October the 24th. There's a daytime occultation of Mercury by the moon in the morning. You'll need at least a pair of binoculars, if not a telescope, to observe this. But be careful. Do not look at the sun with binoculars or telescope. For the Dallas area, the moon will cover up Mercury around 8.54 a.m. Central Daylight Time. And uh, around 10, 12 a.m. Central Daylight Time, Mercury will be uncovered by the moon. Times will vary depending on your location. Slide master, slide number eight. The eastern morning sky on October 26th, you'll be able to observe the conjunction of Mercury and Spica. Slide master, slide number nine. More than a month from now, you'll need to plan on observing on November the 8th a total lunar eclipse. 
in the early morning sky. The eclipse begins around 2 a.m. Central Standard Time and ends for us here in North Texas at sunrise, which is also a moon set, around 6.50 a.m. When we get a couple of weeks away from the eclipse, I'll give you even more details. But if you want to find more information right now, then search NASA Lunar Eclipse. And this is KFI, JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 10, please. I mentioned this one, so I'll just briefly go over it. The Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be on Friday, October the 28th at 7.30 p.m. Details are at their website, texasastro.org. But I don't think it's been updated for the next all this month's meeting yet. Uh, slide master, slide number 11. Now, do any of you out there in Radio Land have any questions or need a fill on any information, or do you just have a general astronomy question? Like Gus did earlier, uh, come now with your call sign if you have a question. Okay, slide master, slide number 12. So as the moon waned at the end of September, so do these words for the segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live. And until next week, Actually, I'll be on Skynet in a few minutes with another segment. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5, JHA, Backdoor Net Control. Thank you very much, Chad. Uh, Randy, K5, JIT, are you here? J-I-T, K-E-5-J-I-T, and 5 B-B. Looking for Mandy. Well, Chaz, I put him in the log, but I think he wandered away. Okay, uh, uh, next. Uh, again, any other check-ins before we continue? Brenda, you're up next. But before she starts, uh, do we have anything else for the uh, for the net? Any other check-ins? This is in 5 BB. Brenda, very interesting hearing about your space exploration news. Uh, especially about Hubble. So take it away, Brenda, WB5OZL in 5BB with exciting news about space exploration. wandered away for a moment. WB5OZL, this is in 5BB in Skynet. Tom, you might want to check and see if I put Brenda to sleep with, <laughs> with uh, my discussion there. Maybe ping her on a back channel. I'm going to do one more time, and then we'll move to the next segment. We can always come back to Brenda later. Brenda, WB5OZL, are you still there? This is in 5BB. It's kind of... Oh, WB5OZL. Hi, I'm so sorry. I stepped away for a couple of minutes, and they went by really fast. So I am here now, and I'm ready to do my segment. We're going to start with uh, space exploration news. Uh, Ingenuity made its 33rd flight. When you consider they sure thought they'd be lucky just to have a few flights. So Ingenuity, which is part of NASA's life-seeking Perseverance rover mission, took to the skies of Mars on Saturday, September 24th, achieving a flight of just over 55 seconds. The four-pound 
photograph soared roughly 33 feet in the air and moved about 365 feet before alighting in a new location according to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, which manages the missions of both Ingenuity and Perseverance. Uh, we've already talked about it before. Uh, Observe the Moon Night is going on now, so I won't... Uh, well, I would like to say that last year, the festivities attracted 500,000 participants in 122 countries, spanning every continent. Next, uh, a Hubble upgrade is possible. NASA announced Thursday that it plans to study the possibility of using SpaceX's Crew Dragon vehicle to boost the aging Hubble Space Telescope into a higher orbit. The federal agency has signed a Space Act agreement with SpaceX to conduct a six-month study to determine the practicable, practicability of Dragon docking with its 32-year-old telescope and boosting it into a higher orbit. The study is not exclusive, meaning that other companies can propose similar concepts with alternative rockets and spacecraft. The agreement comes after SpaceX and the Polaris program, a series of private missions self-funded by billionaire Jared Isaacman, approached NASA about potential servicing missions, including the Hubble Space Telescope. Isaacman is the first private citizen to command an, an uh, orbit spaceflight when he led a group crew of four aboard SpaceX's Dragon in 2021 on the Inspiration4 mission. With Polaris, he is seeking to push the boundaries of private space exploration outward. The first Polaris mission is scheduled for March 2023 on Dragon and will fly to an altitude of 1,400 kilometers while also conducting the first private spacewalks. The next hurricane assessment. Teams at NASA, um, at, at NASA Kennedy have assessed impacts from Hurricane Ian and determined there was no damage to the Armist One flight hardware. NASA will focus on the November 12th to 27th launch period to give employees time for post-storm recovery and identify checkouts for, la for launch. Birthdays. Clifton Williams, September 26, 1932. He unfortunately never flew. He died in a T-38 crash in 1967. Stephanie Wilson, September 27, 1966. STS-121, 120, 131. Livingston L. Holder, September 29, 1956. Was, assi was uh, assigned to the shuttle, but uh, didn't get to fly because of the Challenger accident. Bill Nelson, September 29th, 1942, SPS 61C. Also, he is the current NASA Administrator. James D. Halfel, September 29th, 1956, STS 65, 74, 83, 94, and 101. Stephen Frick, September 30th, 1964, STS 110 and 122. Eric Bowe, October 1st, 1964, STS 126 and 133. And this week in space history, September 30th, 2016, the European probe Rosetta crashes into comet 67P slash Churimov uh, Chir Gerasimenko in a controlled and relatively slow manner. This allows it to take photos of the soil and spectral readings right up to the last minute. In September 27, 2007, the history-making Dawn mission, part of NASA's Discovery Program, managed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, left Earth to study the two largest objects in the asteroid belt, asteroid Vesta and dwarf planet Ceres, providing scientists with an opportunity to learn more about the solar system's formation. Dawn used solar electric propulsion for most of its trajectory control, supplemented by gravity assist from Mars. Dawn spent 14 months orbiting Vesta before moving on to orbit Ceres, the first spacecraft to orbit two different celestial bodies. It observed the dwarf planet until October 2018, when it ran out of attitude control fuel. 
The Dawn mission proves the value of ion propulsion to explore bodies in the solar system. So I got back to net, WB5OZL. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, do we have any um, questions about any of Brenda's items? Any questions or comments? Or do we have any chickens? This is N5BB, Skynet. Okay, now it's time for Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week. Take it away, Chaz. This is N5BB. Thank you, Bill. Once again, this is Chaz, KF5JHA. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week, almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019, with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year, out of the 88 total constellations, so Miss Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas, in a year. And in her honor, we have continued the tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Miss Carolyn's constellation of the week this week is Delphinus, the dolphin, and Equilus, the horse. Equilus constellation lies in the northern sky. It mean, its name means little horse or foal in Latin. It's the second smallest constellation in the sky after Crux, the southern cross. Delphinus represents the dolphin sent by sea god Poseidon to find Aphrodite, uh, who he wanted to marry. Slide master, slide number 14, please. Now, what do you call a horse that likes to stay up late? Well, oh, come on, this is an easy one for us late night astronomers, right? What do you call a horse that likes to stay up late? A nightmare. Oh, come on, I hear you all laughing out there. All right. My buddy has uh, really been depressed since his pet dolphin ran away. His life has no purpose. Well, that's my jokes for the evening for the constellation. Alpha Aquilae is a spectroscopic binary star uh, in, uh, oh, this is slide master, slide number 15, uh, with a spectral type of G03. It has a visual magnitude of 3.92 and it's approximately 186 light years in distance. It's the brightest star in Equilus. R Equili is a Myra class variable, is an M class red giant. It varies in magnitude from 8.7 to 15th magnitude over a period of 260 days. In other words, it's cleaner for us to see than with our two eyes. We need telescopes to see it. It's one of the many variables that are uh, monitored by the members of the AAVSO. The American Association of Variable Star Observers. Slide master, slide number 16, please. NGC 7015 is a galaxy with a visual magnitude of 12.4. It's only 2 minutes by 1.8 minutes in size and about uh, 212 million light years in distance. NGC 7015 is a face-on spiral galaxy that shines at, a, like I said, a dim 12.4 uh, magnitude. This is KF5JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 17, please. Alpha Delphinus is the brightest star in the constellation. It has a combined uh, apparent magnitude of 3.77. Uh, it is a multiple star containing seven different components. A and G, a physical pair, and B, C, D, E, and F, which are optical binaries. Wow. Beta Delphinus was discovered as a binary star in 1873 by American astronomer Burnham. Uh, the system is about 1.8 billion years old and consists of a pair of stars belonging to a spectral class F53 and F54, a giant and a subgiant, approximately 101 light years in distance. Slide master, slide number 18, please. NGC 
6934 is a relatively large globular cluster near the star Epsilon Delphinus. It's approximately 50,000 light years in distance and has a visual magnitude of 8.83. Slidemaster, slide number 19. NGC 7006 is a globular cluster located approximately 137,000 light years away in the outskirts of the Milky Way. And uh, slide master, let's go to slide number 20. The Blue Flash Nebula, NGC 6905, is a small planetary nebula, bluish in color. Well, obviously, because that's what its name is. It can be observed in a six inch or larger telescope. Slide number 21. French One, or the Toadstool, is an asterism in the Astronomical League Open Cluster Observing List. This group of stars is named Toadstool by Sue French. And now you know why it's called French One as well. She's a writer of the Deep Sky Wonders column in Sky and Telescope magazine. Slide number 22, please. There are a few more Astronomical League observing program objects in the constellation of Delphinus, the dolphin, and Aquilus, the horse. I'm just giving you a sampling of a, some of those objects. The Astronomical League has, a, at last count, 75 different observing programs, most of which have about 100 objects. If you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn a certificate and a pen in about a year from the Astronomical League. Slide number 23, and that is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Dolphinus the Dolphin, and Equilus the Horse. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchison, Dennis Harwell for the research words and deep sky objects that I use and steal for every sky net. I also at times use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Next time, I'll take a look at Capricorn, the sea goat, and this is KF5JHA sending it back to our net control. I think his call sign is N5BB. I think his name is Bill, too. Good night, everyone. 73. Very good, Chad. Does anybody have any questions about Chaz's uh, items or comments or any late check-ins? This is N5BB. Skynet. Kilo Indy 5, go from your hotel. Late check-in. KF5 GRH, hello Melissa. Do we have any other check-ins or comments? Okay, Tom, space launches for the week. Uh, quickly, are there any exciting ones? Unfortunately, no Artemis. Yeah, but anything exciting, uh, K5ICX, K5BB. Uh, no, Bill. Why don't you send it over to Brenda with recent astronomical discoveries? She does have a new article. Thanks. That's what I was thinking about doing. Brenda, wb 5 ozl Tell us about Mars. What's going on? With, is there water on Mars? wb 5 ozl in 5BB. But here I found the original in uh, ScienceDaily.com. So I'll go ahead and read this, or at least part of it. It's all, we're almost out of time. New evidence for liquid water beneath the cellar, uh, south polar ice cap of Mars. An international team of researchers has revealed new evidence for the possible existence of liquid water between the so south polar ice cap of Mars. The researchers, led by the University of Cambridge, used spacecraft laser altimeter measurements of the shape of the upper surface of the ice cap to identify subtle patterns in its height. They then showed that these patterns match computer model predictions for how a body of water beneath the ice cap would affect the surface. 
their results agree with earlier ice penetrating radar measurements that were originally interpreted to show a potential area of liquid water beneath the ice. There's been a debate over the liquid water interpretation of the radar data alone, with some studies suggesting the radar signal is not due to liquid water. So the results provide the first independent line of evidence using data other than radar that there is liquid water beneath Mars' south polar ice cap. The combination of new uh, topographic evidence, our computer model results, and the radar data make it much more likely that at least one area of subglacial liquid water exists on Mars today, and that Mars must still be geothermically active in order to keep the water beneath the ice cap liquid. Like Earth, Mars has a thick water has thick water ice caps at both poles, roughly equivalent in combined volume to the Greenland ice sheet. Unlike Earth's ice sheets, however, which are un underlain by water-filled channels and even large subglacial lakes, the polar ice caps on Mars have until recently been thought of, uh, been thought to be frozen solid all the way to their beds due to the cold Martian climate. Normal state. Um, I think I'll just stop there. That's about half the article. And... It's in ScienceDaily.com if you want to go and read the whole thing. So I'm going to send it back to the net, WB5OZL. Very good, Brenda. Um, so, let's see. Tom, is there anything super exciting about visible satellite passages? I'm guessing not, but I'll just ask you. e 5 icx and 5 db Well, Bill, I'll go ahead and just say this, since we're at the end of the net. Uh, uh, the International Space Station has some very good passes on October 5th, October 4th, I should have said October 4th first, October 4th, October 5th, and October 7th. To get the information, go to heavenabove.com. You'll find the information there. Just plug in your longitude and latitude. I'm completely operational, and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. After the Space yet. Station is... Uh, quite a sight to see when it flies over. So that's it, Bill, uh, AE5ICX. Yes, I'll agree. If you've never seen an ISS pass, which is near the zenith that comes up near the directly above, you've got a plan for it. It's just amazing, really, when you look at it. Um, okay. Do we have any late check-ins or any final comments before I close this net? This is N5BB, Skynet, last call. trying to check in there. This is N5BB. Skynet, last call. Nothing hurt tonight. We had 27 hams participating on the air uh, or on Echolink. Thanks to all of you that checked in this evening. We hope you join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy space and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and other Dallas Inventory Club nets. If you're interested, send a message to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics about um, this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and visual streams. Look at w5fc.org. And you'll find all kinds of stuff there. Until next Saturday night, this is N5BB closing a net at 10.31 p.m. for turning a net for a few moments to normal amateur use. Tom, when do you want to start up Afterglow for Between the Planets? K5ICX, N5BB.
Thank you, Bill. Uh, we'll do it in five minutes, so we'll take a break. About five minutes, we'll be back here at uh, 1036, KE5 ICX. For those of you that are monitoring the sun, I just got a uh, notice during Skynet that the sun had another solar event and uh, could have an interruption in... Uh, ham radio activities in short wave frequencies. So just want to let you know the sun's active again. KF5, JHA. If you want to get more information, go to spaceweather.com.
time for the Afterglow Movie Net. My name is Tom. My call sign is Kilo Echo 5 India Charlie X Ray KE5 ICX, and I will be the voice of unreason this evening as we discuss tonight's movie called War Between the Planets from 1966, an Italian science fiction film and part of four Gamma One films directed by Antonio Medicare and Anthony M. Dawson. It wasn't one of the good ones. This is the third, or in this case, second sequel to the Gamma One film. Now, let me tell you what this net is about, most of you know, and a few of you may be listening in the background. What we do is we take an assigned film, which is usually given out as Sunday morning, uh, with links so that you can see the film yourself, multiple links if it's probably like super public domain and everybody in the universe has it, including your grandmother, uh, then you can you can go ahead and watch the film that way. Now, this uh, so let me see, what are we, oh yes, what we're going to do is we will discuss, uh, I have three rounds. The first round is talking about the plot, how does this movie play out logically or illogically. The second round is has to do with uh, characterization and the acting. The third round is a free-for-all. Usually it's special effects or unspecial effects in some films, uh, or anything else you want to talk about, music, uh, the uh, something you forgot in the first two rounds. So what I will do is I will read what is, amounts to a review because I went to Wiki, it has the wrong movie described because these films are very confusing, these four films. So it was the wrong plot for this particular movie, so I quickly found a review to discuss. When I finish with that, I will go ahead and take check-ins, and I will be asking you your call sign, your name, and did you see War Between the Planets? You don't have to have seen the film to check in. Okay, here we go. The War Between the Planets is one of the weaker entries in the series that never really was all that great. Hampered by the usual lifeless dubbing and cheap special effects, it wasn't done any it, it, it wasn't done any favors by hyperbolic American distributors who saddled it with some of the wholly inappropriate War Between the Planets titles. The alternate planet of the Prowl is much better. Anyone expecting some pre-Star Wars 1977? Hold on, this message just came in. Oh, it's just somebody feeling bad. We don't care. Okay, let's see here. Um, where was I? It wasn't done any... Uh, not, uh, Planet of the Prowl is much better. Anyone expecting some pre-Star Wars 1977 Space War shenanigans are in for a massive disappointment. The original Italian title which translates as The Wandering Planet, is more accurate and certainly more apt as a plot tends to wander about almost as much as the eponymous planet, although not nearly as interestingly. The Earth is rocked by a series of violent storms and earthquakes. The United Democracy Space Command demand that the cause is the rogue, determine that the cause is the rogue planets wandering too close to Earth and alert the crew of Gamma-1 Space Station commanded by Rod Jackson uh, as well, well, and, and it, it, boy, this thing reads funny, as well as trying to find a way to divert the planet, he's embroiled in a messy romantic tangle. He's engaged the daughter of his superior, General Norton, Janet, but is really, but is really in love with the communications officer, Lieutenant Terry Sanchez. Putting his feelings to one side, he leads the mission to a wandering planet and realizes that it's actually a living creature. The limited charm of the Gamma 1 series, which is also included um, the green slime, the wild, wild planet, set aboard the space station Gamma 3, but it isn't part of the series, lies in the pulp SF roots of each of the films 
has plenty of intriguing ideas, ideas, some silly ones too. There's a galactic wind in this one, the realization of which were beyond the scope of the budget and expertise of those involved. The idea of a giant organism the size of a planet is certainly a fascinating one, but little is made of it in Renato Moratti, Ralph Moody, and even Reiner's script. It simply reduced to the status of a threat to mankind that needs to be blown up as soon as possible and hang the consequences. Non-sex, nonsensical, not what you thought I said, nonsensical technobabble dominates the first half of the film. A deadening narration in an English dub required to fill in a gaping plot hole is also a liability. And the love triangle is hacky, predictable, and ultimately goes nowhere at all, slowing down on an on already anemic story to a deadly crawl. When the astronauts finally stop fighting each other and talking rubbish, the film gets more interesting, but it's still a rerun of Margarelli's earlier non-Gamma 1 space opera, Battle of the Planets, from 1961. American distributors were seriously lacking in originality in the 1960s. Props, sets, costumes, and effect shots were recycled from earlier films in the series. Understandably so. But most of the cast is new. Jack Stewart assumes command of the station would return in the final film in the series, though given how grumpy he is throughout, one wonders how Rod Jackson ever attained the rank of commander in the first place. The rest of the cast are there to make up the numbers, really. Uh, Obretta Coley is an insipid heroine, while Enzo Fermante, Pietro Martellanza, and Gerardo Unger seem to have been just there for a paycheck, and that's not good enough to earn but nothing more. The film is light on plot, as War Between the Planets is an often surprisingly confusing film, particularly in the middle act, which seems to consist entirely of ballast to keep the water of the ship afloat. Okay, they go in. This is the rest of the actual review part. Uh, uh, we'll have an opportunity to tear this film apart right now. I will now take check-ins. The name of the film this evening that we are discussing is War Between the Planets from 1966, number three in the Gamma One films. So I will now take your call sign, your name, and did you see War Between the Planets? That is optional. You can still check into the net. Just let me know, yes or no, if you saw the film. Here we go. Rock up. Check in. Someone has to go first. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony and Ellis. I did actually see this. I don't know how I survived, but I did see it. Someone has to go second. I didn't see the movie, but I want to listen to y'all talk so I can fall asleep. Cat 5 Theory. I had a tube taken out of my, an NG tube taken out, so my throat's a little sore. So I will just listen. Love the movie, though. I saw the movie. Loved it. W5 BLT. WB5 OZL, Brendan DeSato. I saw it, and I loved it also. Tony in Dallas, he loved the film, and he is first on the list. Cat 5 GRH, Melissa, I don't remember. Melissa, did you see the film or not? Oh, I did not, but I just want to listen to y'all talk so I can fall asleep. <laughs> Cat 5 GRH. Well, Melissa, if you ever suffer from it and... Insomnia, this is the film for you. This will put you to sleep faster than anything. 
Next up is Bill, W5BLT. He says he's tired of shouting at the neighbors, but he did see the film, but he'll be listen only. Uh, we'll check on him occasionally to see if he's still awake. Next was WB5OZL, Miss Brenda. She picked the movie, and yes, she loved the movie, so I have her checked in. I have KG5BZWJ near Weatherford. No, he did not see the film, but we may check in on him as well. Can I get additional check-ins at this time? Please come now. Kilo India 5, Sierra X-Ray Echo, Brandon. Uh, I did not see the film, short time, uh, no comments, just wanted to check in, over. Kilo India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf, cruise in Arlington, I saw two thirds of it and trying to take up the rear. All right, we picked up uh, two more. I've got KI5SXE, that's Brandon. He did not see the movie and he's going to scoot out of here eventually. So uh, thank you for checking in and uh, giving us the number and the count. KI5KWG Cruz, he's in Arlington. He says, yes, he's seen two thirds of the movie. So it's two thirds yet. Yes, and he's finishing up with the dramatic, so somewhat strange ending to the film. Anyone else want to join us? Uh, I'll even take the Echo Link. I, well, I think, uh, well, there's uh, some folks on Echo Link, at least one who may not have checked in. Let me give Echo Link a chance before I uh, do the final check in. So, Echo Link, if you're there, if you'd like to check in, please come down. Okay, well, uh, nobody there, but that's okay. Uh, any final check-ins on this round? If you'd like to join us, we're talking about War Between the Planets from 1966. We're taking initial check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come with your call sign, your name. Did you see this fine film? Okay, I have a feeling that there will be others later on. There are these creatures of the night who come in late on this net, and they do have things to say about whatever the film is. So I'm just going to I'm going to go in order, starting with Tony, who always finds our films fascinating and introspective. So NT5 PM, Tony, you saw the film. What did you think about the plot? I think, why do I have friends who love movies like this? They seem so intelligent and like such good companions, but yet they watch these movies. They forced me to take the role of the Grinch. Way back in sixth grade drug abuse resistance education class, you know, no one ever gives cocaine to sixth graders, but we were all prepared to resist if someone said all the cool people are doing cocaine. Here have someone, you young person who can't pay for it. And, and we were all ready. And, and so I take that training and I bring it forward to the present day. And I am ready to resist any number of people who like this movie, whether you are popular or cool or, or have the good drugs or play in a rock band. It doesn't matter. I'm ready to just say no. This was not a good plot. to yell and scream at each other and occasionally beat each other up 
in a quest to find out what is the cause of these disorders, because as we all know, Earth problems always come from the depths of space. If only that were so. Then there are the winds of space, which randomly cause people to flail about or make swimming motions. And then we go into the giant planetoid, which has pores and arteries and breathing valves and some sort of diluted raspberry puree for blood. The plot just didn't rope me in. It seemed to have a million loose ends. It, its only attempt at subtlety was, of course, our love triangle, where instead of the American tradition of having a big flashing arrow over the heads of the winners of the love triangle, we were allowed to see one member sacrifice himself to activate the antimatter detonator, which strangely caused a diesel fuel explosion, and the other members live. So, I mean, I guess it gets that little point for subtlety, but uh, so tedious, so many loose ends, did not enjoy. Uh, eventually just uh, spent the evening cooking with Aaron. That was much more fun when we had a nice dinner. NT5 PM. All right, thank you, Tony, for that glowing review of the plot. Now, I'm going to skip Melissa right now, but I will be coming back to you because you have to hear what other people's comments are, and then we'll ask you, will you would you be interested in seeing this film alone or with other people? That could be a different answer to each. So keep that in mind as I go down to, well, Bill says he's a horse, a horse, of course, of course. And we had Aquilius as our constellation tonight, so we have special knowledge about that. So I'm going to go to Brenda, WB5OZL. Brenda, you love this film. In fact, you were emoting about how wonderful it is as we watched it together remotely. You know, everybody knows what that is after COVID. So, Brenda, your comments on the plot for War Between the Planets from 1966. This is WB5 said, oh, Don't do it, Melissa, no matter what they do, no matter how they torture you, do not watch this movie. It, you'll, be, you'll be so sorry. Uh, plot. Um, how can I critique the plot when there wasn't one? I, well, I couldn't find one. Maybe it was there hiding in that pink slime somewhere, or out in the, in the um, celestial wind or hiding in between the romantic triad. This is so pathetic. I, honestly, it's one of the most pathetic movies I've ever seen in my life. It was in color, I'll give them that. Uh, some of the actors were reasonably attractive. Uh, their acting skills are so-so. They're not bad. I just think maybe if we had watched it in the original Italian, it might have made more sense. It was... Wait, okay, here's the plot. This wandering planet's going to crash into Earth. That's it. Oh, and they blow it up. That's it. It's not very complex. And uh, they spent a whole lot of time with useless talking. Of uh, it's one review I uh, reading says, you know, they keep saying, "I'm going with you." No, you're not going with me. Yes, I am going with you. Just on and on like that, and it wasn't really very interesting dialogue. I'll have to say. Um, I think War Between the Planets makes it sound a whole lot more interesting than it was. But let's look on the bright side. These people sure did know how to turn knobs and push buttons. And that that part was just magical. And this, I think, kind of gets into special effects. But still, these people did it with such panache and, and such emotion. They uh, yeah, twisted knobs and push buttons and it was just an amazing
amazing performance. Uh, everywhere you looked, there were lights, fleshy lights, buttons and knobs and things. It was wonderful. Okay, this thing made me crazy. Back to net, WV5OZL. Well, I'm disappointed, Brenda, but, but that's okay. I, I thought you, 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 you were really excited about it earlier, but maybe things fell apart. Okay, let's see. Uh, Jay didn't see the film. Brandon didn't see the film. Let me move down to Cruise, KI5KWG. Cruise, you always have something really positive. Plus, you like these bad fil I, I, these films. So, uh, I, I, Freudian slip, I didn't say bad. I said bad as in good. So, uh, Cruz, your thought on the plot from KE5 ICF. KI5 KWG. Uh, this was a bad, bad film. Um, should be sent to its room. Uh, it had no cave girl in miniskirts. Um, and, and I was pretty much done once I realized that. Um, with a nod to uh, Talek Day Goodnight, I, I entertained myself by uh, responding every time one of the actors said Gamma 1. I responded with Gamma uh. um, That amused me. The movie did not. Um, I gave up after an hour. I, re I realized I was watching dialogue probably based on some clips they had heard from Mission Control during the Gemini program and um, then translated that into Italian and then of course it had to be retranslated back into English and we ended up with an hour that I had watched uh, of word salad just absolutely meaningless dialogue, but sounded technical. And, and I realized at that point they had maybe some good special effects for that time period, um, but really had nothing of a plot and nothing to really entertain them. So there, there, there was mine. That's why I turned it off to two-thirds third. KI5, KWG, back to you next. All right, thank you, Cruz. So you actually did like the film. You're just, you're just using reverse psychology. I can, I can see that. Because we're, when we go on this next round, you're going to go crazy and tell us about how great all the acting was. That's coming up next. All right, well, we're towards the bottom of the list. I will come back to you folks uh, here in a few that I skipped over to see your thoughts on all of the comments. But I will take additional check-ins. And anybody like to join us, tonight's movie is... War Between the Planets from 1966, the third of the four Gamma One films from Italy. So please come now. Even if you didn't see the film, just let me know. How many you call, your name, and did you see the film? Kilo Bravo 9, Sierra Oscar Kilo, Sean of Fort Worth. Yes, I did see the film. See, I knew it. I knew there would be somebody out there, and it would be Sean. So, Sean, KB9SOK, what did you think of the plot for War Between the Planets from KB5ICX? Yeah, this is KB9 S OK. What's the scary? Are there three other of these films? Ouch. <laughs> uh, maybe that's where I recognize that space station that they, they used in many, many movies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the plot in this thing was just horrendous from even the get go. Uh, you know, I, I it's, yeah, it's tough. I, I think everybody's pretty well said it. It was just ridiculous to the point of, yeah, absolutely nobody followed orders. Uh, you know, with the spaceships going out there and parking away from the space station and not dogging, 
and climbing out using a stick to hold the door open um, was quite entertaining. And then floating to the space station, yeah, it seems practical with their little power packs. <laughs> they apparently can take them everywhere even though they weren't thrusting anything out. Um, yeah, then the, uh, yeah, it just did it. I mean, I guess it was a simple plot. They think this, whatever it was, was creating this huge gravity ball, um, and they just had to destroy it. That was pretty much the plot. Um, and everything else between was just filler. And, and yeah, luckily this movie was short. It was in color. The, it, it did look okay on the, uh, the TV. <laughs> um, yeah, the fight scene was ridiculous. Uh, and it wasn't even a good fight scene. We didn't even get choreography. <laughs> it was just pretty, uh, pretty poor. And yeah, the commander, I, well, I'll leave that to the next round. Uh, that's more of a character thing. Um, yeah, there's just so many plot holes in this thing. The crazy winds in space, which is just ridiculous. Uh, this living planet, once again, why would a living planet cause excessive gravity? If it did, when the, they've been crushed, if it had that much gravity pull when they landed on it. Uh, I, yeah, there's just, yeah, so much bad science here. And then apparently there's that one guy in the white coat that pretty much ran everything throughout the entire show that they kept asking him to do everything. So apparently that was his whole job. And then the whole gyro repair thing. Once again, just a lot of fillers and stuff to throw in to try to make it more exciting maybe. <laughs> and then, yeah, once again, defying orders and flying towards the planet and taking well, magically. Of course, I guess this was before the uh, all the movies started using nuclear bombs. They decided to use antimatter to destroy things. Um, and of course the president had to authorize it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, they go out there, get on this thing, and uh, just crawl into a hole. But first of all, it's breathing. Well, what was it breathing? They claim there was some air there, but how? You know, and why would a planet, why would a planet breathe? <laughs> Space? I mean, I don't know. And why did he have an axe? I didn't quite understand why he had to be carrying an axe on him. And exactly where was that stowed away? Yeah, it is just this. And I'm guessing maybe this is where they got the idea for Armageddon, because, you know, we had the, the guy at the end that had to sacrifice himself to save the others to uh, blow up the uh, the bad asteroid, as they kept calling it, even though this was called, you know, Battle of the Planets or whatever it was called. But, yeah, just overall, yes, uh, pretty rough plot, unfortunately, or not much of it. Uh, yeah, I was going to send it back to that. KB9, that's okay. Well, thank you, Sean. You actually described the non-plot in more detail than the actual plot was. So there, there you go. You could have had a grand opportunity going to Italy and writing the scripts for the Gamma One series. Four of them. Okay, let me make my comments. I don't know how much I could add to something like this, but uh, first off, I'm going to tell you something. I had a hard time staying awake during this film. I really tried very hard to stay awake, and I did manage to. I also realized something else, that we had reviewed this film before, probably about five years ago, and I fell asleep during that one. So uh, I considered my ability to kind of stay awake for the hour and 14 minutes this movie was, and it seemed like it was more like a three-hour movie with, without intermission, but I, was, I, I stayed awake. So there's that. The, uh, the, the, the whole idea, again, I, I find it quite interesting that when they go to planets and they go to orbit, uh, they claim it takes quite a while, but in reality it only takes about like 35 seconds to get there and then a, another five minutes hanging from the wires, I mean weightlessness, and, and swimming, I mean floating to the space station. Uh, and using their little uh, Mr. Uh, jet packs to get there. Uh, it, it just seems so matter of fact. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a great fan of techno babble. I mean, I can watch Star Trek and they can tell me all sorts of things I don't know. And I'll just sit there and go, well, of course that makes sense. Why would they not you do that? You know, they always use the deflector dish on everything. I don't know why. They didn't do that in the original series, but it became something they did on all the others. I think even Deep Space Nine had a deflector. But then I digress. Let's see. Um, 
yeah, the, well, we're, we'll, we'll talk about the commander and the other co-heads that were in this thing uh, later. But let's see. Um, sending up his girlfriend and sending the, the well, the cat, uh, the, the, the general up and to straighten everything out. Well, you know, when things go wrong, you got to go to get the head office and bring them in. But somehow they managed to destroy that poor living thing. I think that's what happened at the end. I may have dozed off for a second. But whatever happened to this big brown alien thingy, uh, it, it, it was put out of commission. So, and yes, you should always have an axe on board because there could have been a fire and you needed to get through a door or something on the living being. That, that could happen, you know? And of course on the space station, Maybe the doors don't open all the time. You need axe to do that. Or maybe you're cooking. Could be you're cooking and, you know, you, you don't have a sharp uh, knife. So you use the axe. Everybody gets an axe. There's, you know, that makes sense to me. And I don't know what it is about space, but uh, when you fly from... I don't know, Gamma 1 to Gamma 3, and all the spaceships fly within two inches of each other, and they continue to run their little, whatever the stick light, I mean the uh, thrusters, uh, that, why would they be so close? But, no, it's okay, they have nice shiny spaceships and they look good. Uh, so there's that, I guess. Um, I don't know what else to say, I'm just kind of stalling for time. Okay. Uh, I guess that's enough. Maybe, maybe we can get out of here early tonight. I have a feeling we will. Are there any other check-ins before we continue? Tonight's movie is War Between the Planets from 1966. If you'd like to join us, please come with your call sign name. Did you see the film? Please come now. Okay, 5GRA3 check. Oh, Melissa, you're speaking out of turn. I was going to come back to you, but are you going to tell me that you really did see the film and you are admitting to it only now? What, what is on your mind? I'm dying. I'm falling asleep. <laughs> but I'm thoroughly convinced by Tony and Brent, everyone else, including you, that I should not watch that movie at all. And, uh, however, I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to you talk about it. And uh, just wanted to let you know I'm probably going to fall asleep soon. And uh, love you all. Good night. 7-3, I mean. <laughs> Great. Okay, Melissa. Well, go to bed. And uh, you're going to miss out on the best part of the conversation, the end. Okay, well, uh, see you later, alligator. Let's go back up to the top. We're going to start talking about the characterization, although Tony has kind of touched upon it. I'm not sure there's much characterization to actually describe in this film. But we'll start with him. NT5TF. Tony, tell us what you think about, you know, the people in this film. Go ahead. K-E-5-I-C-S. Well, thank you, Tom. Actually, Aaron, having listened to our first run comments, did have a comment to add about characterization. Surely, she thought, if the giant asteroid planet thing is alive, as it seems to be, it, it has, it breathes and has blood and, and tries to trap the uh, the human characters, it would not want to just, you know, randomly smash itself into Earth or any other planet. Uh, having discovered an unpleasant environment, it would want to leave. So something they didn't think about is, you know, why is this giant planet coming to our destruction? It, is it just foul-tempered? Does it just delight in, in causing petty irritation? No, probably not. It probably, you know, eats gas giants and uh, thinks the rings of Saturn are very tasty, it would probably really rather be somewhere else. And if only we could uh, direct it a little, it would just 
go elsewhere. They, they, they didn't really grasp the character of the asteroid very well. As far as the other characters, now we switch to my comments, I mostly couldn't tell them apart. There were boring male characters and boring female characters, and sometimes they yelled at each other and disobeyed orders, and that's all I could really remember about them. Except, except, you know, science fiction predicts the future. The wonderful thing they did in this movie was anticipate the PAO stripes on spacesuits. You have all seen EVAs, and Tom can tell us on which Apollo mission they introduced us because I'm tired, but Tom is tired too, but he remembers this stuff better than I do. Uh, it's, when you put people in bulky spacesuits, it's basically impossible to tell them apart. One's tall, one's short, one's stocky, one's skinny. It doesn't matter. You put a few hundred pounds of Apollo spacesuit on them, and you can't tell them apart. So in order for the public affairs officers in NASA to say, oh, that's astronaut Jones picking up that sample, they had to put stripes on the commander's spacesuit so you could tell them apart. And this movie predicted that. There were a lot of forgettable characters in blank spacesuits, but we did see some designs. A striped helmet, a checkered helmet, a red helmet. The only thing that ever let me temporarily tell these insufferably boring people apart was the different designs of their spacesuits. spacesuits. And I think NASA learned from that. NT5TM. Well, thank you, Tony. And yes, the uh, Apollo missions, I'm trying to remember. I know for sure that it was on Apollo 13. Uh, we had that 14, 15, 16, and 17 all had uh, some designations. Uh, they were called them Commander Stripes. Uh, the thing about it was that they, <laughs> they didn't feel they needed them, but of course the ground crews needed them because how else are you going to tell them apart? So, uh, yeah. Uh, red stripes, and then they were also on the helmets in some cases. But the red stripes were, were mainly where you saw it uh, on every, every one of those missions, so starting with, I believe, could have been Apollo 12, I think it was that early, and then, of course, Apollo 13. I have to go back and, and do that, figure it out. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Melissa bugged out on us, uh, and Bill is the horse. He's the he's, uh, he doesn't want to say anything. That's, that's okay, Bill. I'll tell you what. I'll make a deal with you, Bill. If you're still out there at some point, I'll let you break, and then you can make any comments you want. I will give you the floor. So, uh, But I'm not going to call on you because you said you, you were tired and didn't have a voice. So I'm going to move on to Brenda, WB5OZL. Miss Brenda, your thoughts on characterization. I know you like this part because all the characters are Go ahead, from KE5 ICM. V5 OZL. Um, they were pathetic. Uh, you know, they didn't follow orders. They, this really wasn't a tightly run ship. Uh, a lot of backstabbing. The romantic triangle was also pathetic. Um, those actors may be really famous in Italy. Uh, you know, we didn't know who they were, and I did not find them remarkable either. But uh, one thing I did like is that shirtless fist fight like Captain Kirk. That was pretty good. Although, you know, do you think, think about a real Navy ship. How often do the officers just break out to a fist fight? It just doesn't happen. You know, maybe, maybe a bar fight with the enlisted men down in the uh, below decks, but uh, I, I just think that, that's unrealistic. Or a corporate boardroom. I just, I have never in my life been involved in a fist fight, or even been where people that I worked with were in a fist fight. It's just so unrealistic. So let's see, what else good can I say about the characters? 
Uh, oh, I was real happy they didn't have the women make coffee and sandwiches. At least they didn't go that far, like so many of these old science fiction movies do, where they just objectify women so badly. Uh, but it, a lot of times, I just, I, I hate to admit it, but a lot of these movies, I keep wishing people would die just so we wouldn't have to watch them anymore. And I, I kind of got that way in this movie. It's like, please, somebody die off. So we'll have fewer to watch. I'm not proud about that, but there you have it. All right, back to net, wb 5 ozl All right, thank you, Brenda. And now, our first non-believer, this would be Jay, KG5BZWJ. What do you think? You want to go see uh, and watch this film? Maybe maybe before you go to bed tonight, or maybe tomorrow, War Between the Planets from 1966. Your thoughts about the thoughts of this film.
Okay, well, he was nice enough to let us know ahead of time he was leaving, so he's gone. So next up is KI5KWG uh, Cruise. I think you said you were sticking around. What, what did you think of the characterizations for the signed film? KWG, I'm sure these were stellar performances in the original Italian, and it was all just lost in translation. KI5, KWG, back to you next. That's it? You usually have something introspective and, and, and uh, can uh, do an analogy with some other film that was better that we should have watched and then compare and contrast, and then take it apart in a way that's constructive and helpful and illuminating. No, we didn't get that. Nah, I saw the film. Ah, nah. Okay. All right. Okay. You, you get a chance. Special effects are coming up next, and we know what that'll be like. So next is Sean, KB9SOK, over in Fort Worth. Sean, your thoughts on characterization for War Between the Planets? Yeah, it's KB9, it's okay. Cruise might have it right. Pretty much just blah. <laughs> yeah, the acting was pretty rough, but yeah, maybe we, we can attribute that to the dub over. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, these characters are pretty unforgettable. The, the captain, uh, which obviously uh, was the main character in this, was just ridiculous. You know, the guy was just constantly angry. Uh, obviously, he didn't know how to boost morale or manage the people. Uh, so, yeah, and as everybody's already said, yeah, everybody disobeyed orders. Everybody from the captain down, and, you know. So, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I and mean, there was, man, I just, there just wasn't much interesting here as far as characterization. Um, I actually think the captain might have been the worst. Of course, he's the main person in the film. Uh, there's no way I'd follow that guy into battle. <laughs> I don't think anybody else would either. Um, he kind of reminds me of the uh, the commander of, oh man, I know I'm going to say this wrong. Um, how old the heck was the call? I can't believe it's wrong. Like the, the, the Space 1999, the moon thing. Uh, he was always kind of like that angry, and I'm thinking, man, uh, I wouldn't follow that guy either. But <laughs> they kind of remind me of him. But uh, yeah, and, uh, it was pretty sad. The, uh, the love triangle thing um, made no sense at all. Obviously, both girls knew about each other. Uh, and, and exactly, world disaster happening. Exactly, how do you send up a spaceship just to send up the guy's, you know, fiance? Uh, which obviously just wanted to be up there because he knew, or she knew that he was hanging out with the girlfriend at the end of the world. So, yeah, that was just <laughs> not a lot of good characters here, unfortunately. Uh, and, and yeah, maybe Chris is right. Maybe it's just lost in translation. Anyway, back to that, KB9, that's okay. Well, thank you, Sean, and you're mostly right about all of that. In fact, you're completely right about all of that. Okay, let me go ahead and ask if there are any additional check-ins before I make my comments. We are talking about characterizations for the fine film War Between the Planets from 1966. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign, your name, and did you see this fine film? November 5, India, Mike, Sierra, JJ, and no, I was fortunate enough not to see this fine film. But I do have some recommendations that might have made it better. You're the lone uh, additional, and you're number nine on the list. So, uh, uh, tell us how to make this film better, please. I, I have a strange feeling that you could do a really good job, better than these people that made four of these films. Go ahead. Well, first off, uh, the main thing, uh, replace the female actresses with people like Sophia Loren, Gina Lola Brigida, Verna Lisi, and uh, you know the others, and they should be in that uh, same time frame, so they 
theoretically should have been available for this film and uh, have them get in there. The uh, it, it would have add, added so much to the film that I hadn't seen, so I really don't know, but, you know, just, just go with it. Uh, you know, it would have added so much to the film, you know, better actresses and uh, more eye candy, and uh, it, it probably would have helped. Now, obviously, you know, having an actual plot and things like that would have helped even more, but, uh, you know, that, that one suggestion would have at least, you know, had they done it, would have at least made it watchable, probably, to send five IMS back to net. Well, thank you, JJ, and I, I agree with you. I think that uh, that would have helped a lot, and many of these films, that's exactly what they do. Come on, we know. We've seen uh, several of the films where we do the, uh, the, the, the whole sexy part because the script is so sucky. So you get sexy and sucky, I guess. I don't know, whatever it is. But I, I absolutely agree. So, characterizations. Well, for me, Commander Rod Jackson, and he's great with Weatherman on Channel 4, we used to be, but he looks so different and he's so much angrier in this film. But, you know, I don't know, he just, uh, he's, he's yelling at people all the time, and, and then the General Norton, he yells at people all the time. Uh, so there's a lot of yelling at people. So what did you expect for everybody else to do except, you know, get into a fist fight? Why not? Hey, that guy's a real jerk. So uh, I'm going to punch him out. You're a great guy. <laughs> I do like, and Tony mentioned this, and I said the same thing last night. I'm watching this thing with Brenda. You're a great commander, but you don't follow orders. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, yeah. That's exactly right. You're, you're on a space station. What could go wrong? You know, it, it, you open the door and it says, don't open the door, and you open the door because, hey, you want to go outside and smoke a cigarette, and then all the oxygen sucked out of the spacecraft. Because it says right on the thing, no smoking and do not open the door. But they do anyway, because you know that's what these people are doing. And they seem, you know, hell-bent with, with what, what's the name of the stupid space station, the uh, Gamma-1. And I had to go to Gamma 3 because nobody could get through to them. And, oh, by the way, the crummy communications thing, too. Oh, I can't get a hold of them. They got this little tiny rotating antenna thing sitting on their desk. No wonder they can't communicate with them. Where's the dish that should be out there pointed at the stars? Nothing. Nothing at all. So I, I, I just don't get it. It, it seems to be a very cheaply run organization, sort of NASA without the NASA part. So that part is quite interesting. Now, I want to talk about commanders. And uh, I think it was, who was it, Sean or Cruz? No, I, I can't remember. Earlier, I think it was Sean. He's trying to remember who his Space 1999 commander was. Well, it was Commander John Koenig. Everybody knows that. Commander of the Space 1999 Moon Base Alpha. The first moon base. I got that from the alpha part. So if you look it up if you want to know what alpha means. But I, I knew that already. So yeah, the guy's always angry because he's got a bunch of crappy aliens that are attacking him all the time. They always abduct him, kidnap him, knock him out, or the rest of the crew is doing exactly what happens. They get some sort of uh, a, a brain worm or something and causes them to go crazy. So, yeah, that's to be expected. He's going to be grumpy. Now, the other commander that we all know and love to hate is Captain Kirk, who is Admiral Kirk in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Let me tell you about him. Now, if you remember that film, it also, it also suffered from the same thing this film does, which is you can't stay awake in it because it's putting you to sleep when they go and see the Super computer V'ger, the uh, the music plays on and on and on. Now I love Jerry Goldsmith, but a three-hour tour while we float through a cloud—that's kind of boring. But the thing that you see is that Captain Kirk is very angry when he gets on board the Enterprise, the new one. He's angry about he can't find the elevators. He's angry with 
his first officer who countermanded his orders because he said the ship would have blown up if the captain had continued to do what he did. He got mad at Lieutenant Uhura because she didn't turn the viewer off fast enough. Uh, he was just angry through the whole film. He's throwing things around in the extended version. He didn't see that, but he did through some on his desk. He was very angry, angry Captain Kirk. Nobody likes an angry Captain Kirk. Nobody likes an angry person. Not at the party, not on the space station, not on the starship. They're just jerks. So what they did was, was the director's edition just came out. Uh, that was uh, done back in 2000, but they updated it to 4K and all that jazz. So they re-edited it so that Kirk would be less angry because that didn't make any sense. He'd worked with these people for three years on the show. It's a five-year mission, so he knew who they all were. They were still there. They were older, and yeah, they had to have walkers, but they somehow or another, he should have been attuned to them. But no, while he was at Starfleet Command as the Admiral Fleet Commander, or whatever the hell it is he did, uh, he got angry, sitting at a desk, playing tiddly or answering the phone, or whatever you do. I don't know. Maybe it was tech support for other other starships that call in every time the warp core breaches or something, or they lose a crewman and transporter beam or something like that. He was there to answer the call. So, and remember, some options have changed. So maybe he got, you know, he had to do the medical support. The only person grumpier than him was Dr. McCoy. Okay, so I've managed to not talk about the film, and that was deliberate, because I don't have anything to say about these characters. They all should have died inside the, the, the asteroid stomach, or whatever the heck that was. I would have. I mean, jeez, they just, ah, they were awful. The space is, even, even the colors clashed. Golly. All right, now comes the big, mo oh, the next big moment, which is special effects. This should be a fun little adventure. So we'll start at the top of the list. Tony, NT5PM, what did you think about special effects? You and Aaron, too. Um, ask her what she thought about special effects, or if you missed anything that you want to, uh, uh, about the film that you haven't mentioned so far. So Tony, NT5PM, go ahead. KE5 ICF. that rotating antenna uh, that they had with lots of knobs in the base because I have seen that either that or a very similar model of old 1940s, perhaps early 50s, uh, U.S. Army direction finder in a pawn shop. And I didn't buy it because I'm like, eh, it probably doesn't work, what would I do with it anyway? Uh, but I've seen that before and I bet they got it in a pawn shop too. It, it made me proud to think I've been in the same place as the producers of this movie. The special effects mainly inspired me with curiosity of how did they do that? Not do that like, ooh, wonderful, but how do you make it look that cheesy? I, I was pretty sure we'd either seen this movie before or a, another movie in this deplorable series because I remembered the name Space Station Gamma and I remembered how bad it looked. Like a child's inflatable toy just perpetually half an inch beyond arm's reach. Ah, oh, so bad. And I wondered, what, where did they get the plastic sleeves they used for the arteries of the alien asteroids? I kind of those are. I mean, they look terrible. Maybe I could make a terrible movie too. But they were so uniquely terrible, like using pool noodles. So, so I consistently wondered, how did they do that? Just because I wondered, how did they make it look that bad? Uh, the music was annoying. Uh, the miniature work was bad. The, the direction finder was just the highlight. It's like, I've seen one of those in a pawn shop too, but they bought it and I didn't. And that's the difference between being a successful motion picture producer and being an everyday working stiff like me. If only I bought that at the pawn shop my life. NG5TM. 
Well, thank you, Tony. And yes, I've had a similar experience. I saw that at a antique store somewhere, and I thought, and it's Direction Finder. You, you were correct. Uh, and I, I also had that sort of geekazoid moment. Do, do I want this thing? Even if it doesn't work, and maybe it does, but it probably couldn't make it work. There's no instructions for it. But it would have been cool sitting on your desk, right? Uh, of course, you have to move everything off the desk because it's so darn big. But yeah, I, I saw that. I thought it was pretty cool. It was probably the best thing in the whole movie, that and the death of that one guy. Okay, let's see. Melissa went to bed. Bill doesn't want to say anything. Uh, next would be Brenda, WB5OZL. Brenda, your thoughts on anything you want, including the really special special effects from War Between the Planets. Go ahead, from KE5 ICX. Thank you, WP5OZL. Um, well, they definitely had special effects. And uh, on it, to be honest, I think they did pretty well on their limited budget. Um, fairly inventive stuff. Nothing was much believable. But um, they had lots of buttons and lights and dials and knobs and things. And that was pretty cool. And the planet was really kind of interesting. It was a scary kind of place. And they did it without spending a whole lot of money. So I'll give them that. Uh, I have a feeling the whole budget was pretty low. Uh, the, oh, those wires and the, the EVAs. Those are just awful. And uh, space suits. They were laced up with, with lacing. How would that keep the air in? I didn't understand how that could be in a, even a remotely effective spacesuit. I just kept looking for them to expire. Uh, let's see, what else? Hmm. Oh, the spacesuits. Spaceships were really cheesy and unbelievable. But this was the 60s, lots of cheesy sci-fi movies being made. Obviously they made money, because they sure did make a lot of them, and this was another one of those. All right, back to net, wb 5 ozl Thank you, Brenda. Well, you know, you're talking about, well, they didn't have a big budget. You don't know that. They may have had a huge budget. You know, they could have, uh, uh, maybe they had $20 million making the film, and most of it went to booze. That's entirely possible. They made 2001 A Space Odyssey two years later with $10 million. That's it. That's all they had. Of course, it was 1968, and that's like $100 trillion today. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it all depends, but I digress. Okay, uh, let's see. Jay, I'm going to give you an opportunity for your any final comments. I know you want to see the film now. You said so. I think you did. In fact, I wrote it down. Jay, yes. So, KG5BZW, any comments you want to make, go right ahead from KE5ICX. BZW. I said I would give it, but yeah, there's just there's just to reiterate, there's just a lot of the the sound familiar. Uh, it, I'm almost <clears throat> with, uh, comfortable in uh, making. Uh, well, I'm trying to measure this. Sometimes I I, I measure uh, things in best, even though I don't actually practice making bets or anything like like actual uh, measured okay oh uh, maybe i bet three dollars or something it's a weird thing i do i don't know <clears throat> but um yeah there's just a lot familiar about it um especially i don't know yeah, people seem to introduce like to introduce drama drama in those stupidest of ways, like, uh, like making people that uh, so call order, that kind of thing, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about that, so I'll just head back to the next control, KG5, PCW. 
Yeah, that was well done. I guess the stats were passable. Um, but like I said, I think we've seen better stuff in TV shows uh, that came shortly after that. So, it, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the budget was. Apparently, like you said, it's been all spent on beer, which would uh, make a lot of sense with how the film turned out. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they had a good time. But, uh, yeah, I think some of the miniatures were horrible from the outside when they were trying to show them. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's a long list. Anyway, back to that, KB9S, okay. Yeah, Bob, I All right, thank you, Sean. I'm going to call on uh, JJ, N5IMS. I know you didn't see the film, but uh, you, you got any final words of wisdom before we close out this evening from KE5ICX? Well, listening to uh, every everyone's comments and stuff, and uh, I, I've got one final suggestion to improve this movie, or this fine film, sorry. Didn't mean to call it a movie, it's a fine film. Uh, and that would be uh, give them 30 minutes to put all of the relatively decent, or at least the best parts of the movie in there, you know, so you recut it and put it in there. Now, it doesn't have to make sense because the entire movie didn't make sense anyway, but, you know, just put it in its first 30 minutes or whatever, and then at the end of that 30 minutes, you blow everything up, everybody dies, and you roll, you know, the final credits, and uh, that would make this a much better movie, it sounds like, and uh, they probably could save money in the process. This then five IMS back to net. Okay, JJ, I agree. Have you ever seen the uh, the, the the how how it should have ended or whatever they do Casablanca, and uh, the two love lovers they get on the airplane and they fly out, and uh, a plane takes off and Bogart and. Um, uh, the, the, the captain are, are looking and he says, well, Roy, this is the beginning of a great relationship. And they look up at the plane and it explodes. And they just look at each other and walk off into the fog. What a great way to end a movie. That was better than the original ending. Oh, what can you do? You can't improve on a classic. Or can you? Okay, uh, my final comment. Uh, first off, nobody talks about the cool Puppeteer XL5 look at the very beginning with a massive city. It must have been almost uh, eight feet uh, wide and about six feet uh, long or other way around, I guess. Uh, and uh, the cars, you missed the car. You know, we talked about those cool cars that had the fins and the, and the jet engines in the back. Who, who uses those things? And then, of course, uh, the building falls apart for unknown reasons. And we go, why? Why? I, I don't understand. But it, that's the way it was, and that's the way it will be. So kind of kind of missed the groovy cars. I don't know. Let's see. What else could I tell you? I guess that's it. Uh, other note. Do we have any final check-ins or any final comments? Come with your call now. W5BLT, uh, just a final comment. something as you guys were talking about this um, as a little kid I remember watching some of these uh, Gamma series movies um, and so I started going back and looking for them I, I think I found every one of them but the wild wild planet um, let me say one thing in my defense um, I was in the hospital when I watched this with a stomach blockage um, and so the morphine had kicked in and it was a pretty good movie then. Um, so maybe I had a mental blockage as well as a stomach blockage when I watched this. Um, but I also figured out something as a blind guy watching this. Um, you guys comment on the special effects and stuff. And so in my brain, um, I'm imagining a spaceship that actually is probably pretty cool um, that isn't there visually. <laughs> and who knows what I was uh, imagining on the, uh, on the morphine. Um, 
and, and apparently um, this movie was painful to watch as much as the stomach blockage. But um, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate, um, uh, I had not realized that this was part of a series, and now as I was going back watching the previews uh, on the movies that I was finding on YouTube on the four movies, uh, it's coming back to me, and I watched these uh, back in elementary school. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, it, it is interesting to um, imagining uh, things and outside the spaceship and the pictures that I put together mentally that are not there uh, on the screen. Um, so I think if you close your eyes and try that, it might make for a better movie. W5BLT. Well, thank you, Bill, and I, I do have to tell you that uh, I had a similar experience, not recently, but many years ago, I ended up with a super migraine, and they, they shot me in the butt with uh, something, and that made me feel better, and actually that helped a lot because they were showing a Jerry Lewis movie, and I think that was worse than the pain I was in, but that's just me, I'm, I'm not a huge Jerry Lewis fan. Well, let me see. Anyone else have any final comments? All right. Let me uh, bring up next week's movie because I don't remember what it was. Please stand by. All right, this is uh, something a little different. I don't know if it's any good or not. It does, uh, it does have, uh, what the heck is in this film? I've already forgotten. I'm getting tired as well. Uh, this one would be Agent Mattel. Yes, in the movie called The Ambushers. So I thought you might enjoy something a little different. So uh, look for it uh, the following week. Uh, October 16th, we'll be watching a uh, long-lost science fiction series that was called Search. And this is the first episode of the series. There was a uh, made-for-TV movie that came before it called Probe. But uh, it actually was rather entertaining. I rather liked it. And I think you'll enjoy it as well. Uh, very much forgotten today, but it was I think it was on for a couple of years. So next week will be Matt Helm and the Ambushers. Uh, from 1967. I will send this information out if you're not on the email list then uh, send an email to me ke5icx at yahoo.com echo 5 india charlie x-ray at yahoo.com and I'll put you on the list. I think everybody's there. Cruz, I missed you one week and I think I got you on there now. You should be getting the update. If not, tell me now. Um, also, uh, you can go Facebook and find it there. Look for Afterglow and Movie. Those are two words, Afterglow and Movie. And just sign up, say you want to be a part of the group, and I'll let you in, and you'll have the list. All of the movies are listed under Guide. Um, they change, they keep changing things, and they're making it different, difficult to create lists like I used to. So look under the Guide, and you will find the next three movies that are available uh, and links. So that will get you ahead of the game if you'd like. That's it for me. Uh, everybody have a good Sunday, and uh, we'll see you here next week, Saturday night at 10.30. 7-3, everybody. See you next time. This is KE5 ICX. That's clear. And we used up all but three minutes of our allocated time. So 